and we want to give you a little bit of sense of what this series is about. It's an opportunity to highlight exclusively MSU faculty members and the research that they do in the hopes of allowing other faculty, students, and the community to have a better sense of the wealth and breadth of faculty on campus and to begin to interact with faculty in a different manner. Also to allow students to see faculty you might not normally interact with and think this is a person that I could take a class with, I could do research with, maybe they could be part of my dissertation committee. So we really want to bring to the larger community the wealth of experiences that are here at Michigan State University. And we try to cover wide topics that can be come at from a lot of different angles to show that there is no one right person perspective and that it's important to engage in dialogue. And we're going to start out with each of our panelists presenting on the topic from their lens. We'll have a little bit of cross-panel conversation and then we really are going to open up the floor to you to have a dialogue around the topic of confronting wilderness, human interactions with nature. And before we get started, I want to make sure to acknowledge people who have been instrumental in pulling this together, one of which is sliding out the door and just came back in, and that's John Beck. He takes on the illustrious role of pulling our panels together and working through the topics and just does a wonderful job with that. We have Joyce Samuel, who staffs the event. We have all of the event co-sponsors, and for each lecture series, departments and programs around the university partner with us in the Honors College to make sure that we bring this to fruition. And of course, our esteemed panel this evening, we couldn't do this without them, and so we are very thankful for them. I'm going to introduce each one of them and give a bit of a sense of what they will discuss tonight, and then we'll just go forward and let them do their presentations. We have Dr. Deborah Carmichael from Writing, Rhetoric, and American Cultures, and she's going to speak with us about nature writing, traditions, and transformations, and look at some of the early descriptions of the American wilderness, and look at some of the conflict attitudes towards nature. So spiritual versus aesthetic, or spiritual and aesthetic versus resource and commercial asset, and that tension that's involved there. Using examples that compare the writing of William Bradford and the Virginia Cavaliers in the 1940s, 1640s, I can read, just can't see. The permeable boundaries between nature and travel writing and how they've existed since colonial times. The importance of the landscape and how it describes what it is to be American and the move from nature writing to environmental writing and the authors who helped to bridge that shift. And so we're going to get a sense of the writing aspect of confronting nature and wilderness and using those words interchangeably. What does that really mean? We had some of those conversations before we started the session. We have Dr. Michael Nelson to my immediate left from Lyman Briggs Fisheries and wildlife and philosophy. And he's going to look at the concept of wilderness both in philosophy and on the ground and helping us understand that we act on our ideas. And so if we have a flawed idea, we're going to have a flawed action and flawed policies and help us think about different aspects of wilderness as a real place as an experience, as a concept, and then how does that translate into what we do with conservation policies. To my immediate right, we have Dr. William Porter from Fisheries and Wildlife, and he is the Boone and Crockett Chair of Wildlife Conservation. He's going to be looking at the Great American Experiment in Wilderness Conservation and looking at the Adirondack Park in northern New York State as one example of the greatest, one of the examples of a great experiment in American conservation. And we'll look at things like while we have a lot of debate around conservation, the fact that we actually can have debate is tied to there being a vision. And so it's important to recognize that. And then looking at the fact that the model, though it came out of the hands of a few people and mixed it with political power, we are able to go forward and do things in conservation because of the broad public interest and the broad public commitment. What does that mean? And how future generations are going to have to think about what are more inclusive paths to wilderness conservation. And we will finish up our presentations with Dr. Robert Richardson 
from the Department of Community, Agricultural, Recreation, and Resource Studies, and also the Environmental Science and Policy Program. And there we'll look at the economic value of wilderness. So besides the benefits of recreation, there's always trade-offs in land use. And what does that mean? And how do we look at ecosystem services? And what's the impact of the wilderness on neighboring communities in terms of income and employment? So you can see we're going from issues of writing to the philosophical context, to what does conservation mean, to economics. And when we bring that all together, I'm sure that you'll have other issues that emerge. And we want to engage in that dialogue and see where it takes us. And we're going to encourage you to continue the dialogue after this evening. And with that, I would like to turn to Dr. Carmichael and let her begin her presentation. Thank you. Okay, I'll start by talking a little bit briefly about why this interests me so much. Because when we write about nature, oftentimes we're really revealing a lot about ourselves and our attitudes and our culture. And I think nature writing in, um, <clears throat> in America uh, definitely shows how that comes together. And, and I'll talk a bit about some of the ways that we're talking about more than nature when, when we're writing about it. Um, defining nature writing can be difficult because it does blend and blur with things like travel writing, um, obviously environmental writing, certain science writing. Um, so there's a, a real blend. Probably the purest nature writing is what we do on a very personal level in a journal or a diary or a letter to someone. I guess now we would tweet. I don't know. Um, but that's probably the purest nature writing where we're, we're talking about a very personal experience. But a lot of what I'll show you is um, how the nature writing requires an author. So when we're talking about nature, it's always filtered through the observations, the description, the interpretation of what's being seen. I used Emily Dickinson as a, an example of this because of her, her poetry was observing the nature around her home and using that to illustrate lessons for her, her reader. Um, the ambivalent, ambivalent values that you mentioned, um, the aesthetic or the, the spiritual significance versus a political or an economic use and importance is something that's been an ongoing kind of uh, debate, discussion um, in the United States since very, 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 very early on. This, by the way, is um, Thomas Cole's um, Oxbow, and it, it shows the, the, the wilderness and what it was like before settlement, and then it shows how the, the land has been cleared and um, is ready for crops. So on the spiritual side of, of this debate, um, I called out a spiritual errand into the wilderness. William Bradford wrote a history of Plymouth Plantation um, and described their uh, first seeing the United States. And I'll read you just a, a tad of what he wrote. He said, what could they see but a hideous and desolate wilderness full of wild beasts and wild men? Uh, for summer being done, all things stand upon them with a weather-beaten face, and the whole country full of woods and thickets represented a wild and savage hue. So looking at um, the shore and, and coming to, to uh, this new world, they saw it as a spiritual test and a very wild and dangerous type of, of country. Um, in contrast, Virginia Cavaliers, um, I've called this Return to the Garden because their letters, which were compiled um, in 1649, talk about the, the, the pleasures and the joys of living in this new world um, and how easy life is. Um, one of the letters says, uh, the land in Virginia is most fruitful and produceth, produceth with very great increase whatsoever is committed into the bowels of it. So they're, they're describing this experience of, you know, plant your seed and then sit back and, and wait to, for the harvest. They're, they're describing it as a very pleasant place to live. They talk about the only labor involved is to clear the land so that you can plow it. 
right? And then after that, life is easy. Um, and the fact that uh, they're emphasizing this clearing the land and plowing it connects to some of the concepts of why we needed Indian removal, because um, the English knew how to use the land properly. Right? Um, the next one I'm looking at is Thomas Jefferson, um, natural philosopher. Before we had um, different disciplines and sciences, um, one could be a natural philosopher. He wrote um, answers to queries from uh, a contact of his in France uh, on the state of Virginia uh, responding to questions. And he, he describes the rivers and how navigatable they are, uh, talks about the seaports and how large the vessels are that could, could uh, come there, um, has a list about mountains and rivers and, and various natural uh, sites, and he has a very detailed chart comparing animals of Europe to animals of America. Um, and one of the animals he brags about is the bison um, as being an animal that uh, America had and France did not. So in some ways, this promotion and this discussion of nature was telling the Europeans, we may not have large cities and financial centers, but we have this wonderful natural world um, that we can enjoy, that others in Europe don't have those same kinds of, of uh, situations. And I'm going to talk a bit about landscape and literature because we were developing an American literary presence. And again, we didn't have castles and kings, but we had nature. Um, and this nature pre produced individuals that were self-reliant, rugged individuals, um, which plays into the American exceptionalism, uh, manifest destiny. So focusing on the land, the natural resources, the natural wonders of the continent, um, and this ability to own land and push west to new lands. Um, transcendentalism obviously was an influence on how we write and talk about nature. Um, Thoreau's Walden um, looks at man in a different sort of way. Um, instead of original sin, now we're thinking about an individual who has a purity um, and is corrupted not by um, something of a, a spiritual nature, but by things like political institutions, things like that. So they're, they're looking at man as a part of nature. So a, a, again, a different kind of perspective. Um, and I'm talking a little bit about Frederick Jackson Turner and the significance of the frontier in American history. Um, his frontier thesis, the existence of an area of free land, its continuous recession, the advance of American settlement westward, explain American development. Um, and his speech in 1893 declares that um, with the Census Bureau report, there is no more frontier. And this was a major shift in how we thought about American land, because now there was no uh, open spaces. There was, there was no longer this border, this frontier that we could cross from a civilization to a more savage wilderness, um, that it was going to shift the way Americans had to think about themselves and their, their social structures because they didn't have that safety valve anymore um, of people moving from civilization to strike out as that rugged individual in the free land of the West. So it was a, a major shift in how we had to think of ourselves in terms of Americans in the land. Um, meanwhile, in the urban East, at the same time, we were seeing um, a parks and playgrounds movement where we we're trying to create natural settings for city dwellers, uh, particularly those of working class, um, ethnicities, uh, races that were living in tenements, um, that they felt that they needed this natural setting. So they created Central Park as a natural idyllic setting. Um, they had to de deliver the dirt from New Jersey to create Central Park, um, but they created this natural setting. Um, one touch briefly on some people um, who were very important to um, calling attention to the need to preserve the natural wonders that we had. Um, obviously, John Muir, very important um, as Sierra Club founder, uh, instrumental with uh, saving Yosemite Valley and, and getting Sequoia National Park in place. Um, 
And it's the shift, too, that we see in terms of how we look at, at how we discuss nature. Um, earlier, he would have been called a naturalist. Now, in hindsight, we call him an environmentalist. Um, so, that, again, that shift and that blur that we start to see in how we write and speak about nature. And um, Aldo Leopold, A Sand County Almanac, if, if you've never read this, you really must. It's such a delightful book. Um, founder of the Wilderness Society. And again, conservationist, but now we think of him more in terms of an environmentalist. Um, and I want to close with something that he had in Sand County Almanac. Um, Our ability to perceive quality in nature begins, as in art, with the pretty. It exp expands through successive stages of the beautiful to values as yet uncaptured by language. So writing about nature is always that challenge for us. Thanks for the invitation. It's, it's nice to be able to give a talk and not have to get on an airplane, so I'm grateful for that, if for nothing else. Um, so my comments are, are a combination. I've been working on the concept of wilderness and the debate about the concept of wilderness for almost 20 years. Um, but at the same time, while that's a kind of leisurely academic uh, debate, um, I, I'm, you know, there's also a kind of sense of urgency. So trying to think where does wilderness fit into this, this sense of urgency or where do those two things meet? And I was trying to put those thoughts together. So I, I could tell you many things about wilderness. I could tell you about the word, origin of the word itself from the old English meaning the place of wild deer. I could tell you about the history of our ideas about wilderness and how our ideas about its value have changed over time. How in the Christian Bible, wilderness was the land that was separated both from humans and from God. It was the foothold of the devil. Joel 2, 3. The land is the Garden of Eden before them and behind them a desolate wilderness. I could tell you how the transcendentalists of the 19th and early 20th centuries, the likes of Muir and Thoreau and Emerson, still separated humans from wilderness, but thought of it and nature instead as the handiwork of God, thereby imbuing it with positive value, a source of inspiration and purity. I could tell you how the American wilderness movement of the last century, led by Roosevelt and Sigurd Olson and Bob Marshall and Aldo Leopold, moved to set aside areas of wilderness as places that served human interests of certain sorts. How Aldo Leopold, a man who thought and wrote carefully about wilderness for 30 years, changed his mind about the value that wilderness held, moving from narrowly recreational values to more expansive values for science and beyond. I could tell you of native peoples who mocked this idea. Chief Luther Standing Bear, we did not think of the great open plains, the beautiful rolling hills, and the winding streams with tangled growth as wild. Only to the white man was nature a wilderness, and only to him was the land infested with wild animals and savage people. I could tell you how ecological science and our ideas about wilderness and nature danced back and forth over the past 100 years, and how ecologists who advocated for wilderness reserves for science were kicked out of leadership positions in the Ecological Society of America because of their advocacy, creating the Ecologist Union instead, which then became the Nature Conservancy. I could tell you how this swirl of our ideas about wilderness coalesced into the received view of wilderness, a view where humans are separate from the, from the wilderness, where wilderness is, a, is set in opposition to civilization, where humans are only to be visitors or spectators, where environmental change is governed only by non-human forces. I could tell you about the Wilderness Act of 1964, the single most important and powerful piece of wilderness legislation the world has ever seen, which codifies the received view of wilderness, defining wilderness, quote, in contrast with those areas where man and his own works dominate the landscape, an area where earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man, where man is a visitor who does not remain. I could tell you how these ideas, these social constructs pervaded not only the Western mind, but also those who craved the affluence of the West and these symbols of that affluence, how these ideas served to remove native peoples from their homelands and make way for wilderness parks and reserves around the world and even in our own country in the past. 
I could tell you how federal agencies are sometimes paralyzed by their wilderness or natural regulation mandates, sometimes even using wilderness ideologies as a weapon against science, and even against other values like ecosystem health. And I could tell you a wondrous tale of the past 20 years of the critiques of wilderness and the responses to the critiques of wilderness and the responses to the responses to the critiques of wilderness and on and on and on. Wilderness is ethnocentric, not universalizable, genocidal, androcentric, phallogocentric, unscientific, it's like a song, uh, unphilosophic, outmotive, strategically disadvantageous. No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Yes, it is. I could tell you all of those things and more, but I won't. I want to instead ask why wilderness is important today. Why do we care about wilderness today? What role might wilderness serve in a world gone mad, in a world seemingly bent on its own destruction on a planet in peril? I can think of a couple of things, a couple of reasons to still cling to both our ideas about and those areas we call wilderness. And I would invite you to try to think of a couple more. Mine have to do with morality, with wilderness for moral reasons, moral anchoring. First, I, I can't speak for others, but I know that when I'm in places I think of as natural and whole and healthy, and when I'm with others, I'm a better person. I'm more humble, I'm more caring, I'm more attentive, I'm more respectful, I'm more light and happy. And of course, the challenge is, how do you bring those wilderness values, that sense of being a better person, back home with you? How can moral clarity become part of our daily lives? Sure, wilderness experiences give us a reference, a sense of what we could be, and that's hugely important. But how do we connect the dot of moral clarity with the dot of our daily lives? Second, maybe our love for, of wild places means that we have other work to do in the world. How can we who say we love nature, who say we love wild places and things, so casually let those places and things come to ruin? My colleague, uh, nature writer and, and philosopher Kathleen Dean Moore reflects on this um, as she holds her granddaughter, and I'll just read you what she writes. She says, I held my granddaughter in my arms and sang to her then an old lullaby that made her soften like wax in a flame, molding her little bone, body to my bones. Hush a bye, don't you cry, go to sleep, you little baby. Birds and the butterflies fly through the land. I held her close, weighing the chances of the birds and the butterflies. She fell asleep in my arms, unafraid. I will tell you, I was so afraid. Poets warned us, writing of the heartbreaking beauty that will remain when there is no heart to break for us. But what if it's worse than that? What if it's the, unbroken, the heartbroken children who remain in a world without beauty? How will they find solace in a world without wild music? How will they thrive without green hills edged with oaks? How will they forgive us for letting frog songs slip away? When my granddaughter looks back at me, I will be on my knees begging her to say, I did all I could. I didn't do all I could have done. It isn't enough to love a child and wish her well. It isn't enough to open my heart to a bird graced morning. Can I claim to love a morning if I don't protect what creates its beauty? Can I claim to love a child if I don't use all the power of my beating heart to preserve a world that nourishes children's joy? Loving is not a kind of la-di-da. Loving is a sacred trust. To love is to affirm the absolute worth of what you love and to pledge your life to its thriving, to protect it fiercely and faithfully for all time. Third, I think of my Ojibwa Anishinaabe colleagues. I think of their story of the relationship between humans, wolves, and wild nature. In their story, the wolf, Maingan, is a teacher, a kinomagan, of humans. The great spirit entwined their fates. If the wolf's demise came to pass, then the end of wild nature would be marked. The end of wild nature would mean that the Ojibwa would pass from existence from loneliness of spirit. The end of the Ojibwa would mark the beginning of the end of the human race. For humans have been given something powerful by the great spirit, the medicine, the knowledge of how to live with nature. The loss of Maingan demonstrates the loss of this vital wisdom. We can wonder if the fate of wilderness, wild animals, and humans are entwined in some manner, if saving wilderness and wild animals is a form of saving ourselves. Finally, maybe wilderness, in area and in concept, 
is a safety line of sorts, something we can hold on to as the ship bucks and tosses. Or maybe it's the loss or slipping away of wilderness, the slipping through our hands, the grief of loss, the rope burn that is important that might move us. And I want to end on a rope theme, <laughs> uh, if there is such a thing as a rope theme, uh, that sort of illustrates that with a poem by a colleague, uh, Alison Hawthorne Deming. Uh, her poem, Rope, I think really nicely captures um, that, that sentiment, that value of, of wilderness. The man gathers rope every summer off the stone beaches of the north. There is no sand in this place where the Labrador current runs like an artery through the body of the Atlantic, channeling particles that once were glacial ice and now are molecules, making not one promise to anyone. The man gathers rope with his hands, both the rope and the hands worn from use, the rope from hauling up traps and trawl lines, the hands from banging into rocks, rusted nails, fish knives, winch gears, and bark. The rope starts to pull apart fiber by fiber like the glacial ice, and the man wishes he could find a way to bind it back together, the way a cook binds syrup or sauce with cornstarch. The rope lies in the cellar for years, coiled, stinking of the sea, and the fish that once lived in the sea and the sweat of the man who wishes he could save one strand of the world from unraveling. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carmichael and Dr. Nelson. We're going to do a quick um, computer change, and then we'll continue on with Dr. Porter. And I realized that I didn't introduce myself earlier. So for those of you that do not know me, I am Dr. Cynthia Jackson Elmore, the Dean of the Honors College. Thank you. It's an honor to be here tonight to talk about a topic that I enjoy and uh, have found uh, to be very stimulating throughout uh, a long career. I want to introduce you to a concrete example of wilderness in a place that doesn't seem initially as wilderness, but reflects the ideals of wilderness that I think are going to be more likely to be those that we hold in the coming century. Um, as was, was uh, indicated in the outset, we're really thinking about why we can talk about wilderness, why we can debate wilderness, and it's because some people more than 100 years ago had some tremendous vision, some really tr profound prescience. I'm not sure that they were thinking wilderness, but they were thinking conservation, and conservation and wilderness are two of the, the pivotal concepts in the American uh, model of conservation. But it wasn't just visionaries, it was people who knew how to, to take vision and put it into reality, and these were people with political power. We sometimes are cynical about those people, but they are integral to this concept that we hold in America today of wilderness. And finally, we live in a world where, yes, there are those with power and those who have the ability to make things happen, but in a democracy, all of us have a significant role to play, and if there is to be wilderness in the future, that role is something we're all going to have to accept. This is a place that is extremely important. You all recognize it because you've been brought up looking at this map in your classrooms, maybe not perhaps a satellite image from space, but very similar. This is a region that is the, the place where Thomas Cole painted that painting. It is the region where that painting has its most important impact. This is the place where, um, as Dr. Nelson said, the, the question is asked, how will they thrive? This is the, this is the region of the Ojibwe. Uh, this is the place where wolves are a questionable uh, commodity, a questionable species, a characteristic of wilderness. This is a um, very important place to all of us. Um, it's a land of water resources. It's a land of forest resources. It's a land of conservation precedent. These are the qualities that we think are important, and this is a very concrete example of that. 
I want to talk more specifically, though, about an eastern part of that, a six million acre Adirondack Park, a place in upstate New York that most of us in the Midwest are not familiar with, but everyone in New York has an opinion on. This is a place that has a storied history, a remarkable history. This is the place where we first really, as a society, saw the perils of un unregulated exploitation. This is where we began to recognize nature as a place where we could thrive. This is where we saw Thomas Cole's painting being played out. This is the place where we first worldwide set aside large forested areas as forever wild. What does that mean, forever wild? This is a place where the public established regional planning on a scale that had never been conceived of before, uh, and it continues today. This is a place where we are now confronting the largest experiment in whether we can actually have human economies and wilderness at the same time. This is a place that is surrounded within 500 miles, that's a day's drive, of 93 million people. That's the densest population anywhere in the world within close proximity to what is ostensibly a wilderness. Now, it's not a place that has always been uh, the jewel. It's not a place that has always been free of human activities. In fact, mankind went into this region uh, over the past 400 years and exploited the daylights out of it. It took the beaver out in about 30 years, almost all of them, down to about five individuals from probably several hundred thousand. It took the moose out in about 20 years feeding loggers. It took the cougars out and the wolves out because they were competing with those who wanted to hunt deer and those who wanted to raise livestock. It took the titanium and the iron ore and the wollastonite and the garnet. Fortunately, there was no gold. Fortunately, there was no coal. Because had there been coal and gold, there would have been a lasting negative impact. The mining of these other ores proved to be relatively benign. It took the forests out. And when it did, it moved to Michigan. This is a land that was heavily exploited. And it's a land that people who were thinking along the lines of philosophy and nature and nature writing were seeing the image of, of unregulated ex exploitation played out. And these people took exception to that. And these folks wrote about it. And they wrote eloquently. And they managed to begin to change some minds. Now, they didn't have political power, but people like Collis Huntington and Thomas Durant had enormous power. These were the Bill Gates of their, area, of their era. These were the Rockefellers of their era. These were the very wealthy, and they had political power, and they saw an opportunity, and that opportunity was a wilderness that could rejuvenate the spirit, rejuvenate the soul, a place where the rich could go to recreate, and they built monuments. They built elegance in a rustic way in the Adirondacks. And it brought them in close proximity to those who were exploiting the Adirondacks. And by quirk of fate, it brought them into a time when there was a significant drought and huge fires, and those fires threatened the monuments that they had built. And those people took political action. They had access to the halls of Congress and to the legislature in New York. And they changed the laws. They set a cornerstone for conservation that was, and, a, and put down a marker that was picked up by people that you have heard of, George Bird Grinnell, uh, Gifford Pinchot, Theodore Roosevelt. These are the individuals who coined the term conservation and brought it into the American vernacular. Before them, it didn't really exist as a concept in the American mind. These were the folks who set up the national park system and the national forest system. And these are the folks who set in motion what would become the Wilderness Act that Dr. Nelson talked about of 1964, probably one of the most important uh, pieces of legislation in the history of conservation. And these were the folks that set in motion an idea of developing wilderness while developing an economy. And the question was, how could you do both? This became threatened in the early 1960s when the middle class in American, the American public had the wealth to begin to develop second homes. 
And here again, some individuals step forward with incredible leadership, incredible prescience. Harold Hochschild is a person you've never heard of. He was the head of Amex Corporation. He raped the Congo. He took every piece of ore that he could find in the Congo and turned it into money, and he became enormously wealthy. And he had a second home in the Adirondacks. And he said, in the Adirondacks, we're not going to do that. And, Theodore, and Nelson Rockefeller was probably the most powerful governor the New Yorkers ever had. The two of them got together with a guy named George Davis, who was a visionary, and they put together what is probably the most potent and most comprehensive set of land use regulations ever to exist in the world, and they set that in motion in the Adirondacks. Now, that's created a very interesting dynamic because we have a set of land uses in the Adirondacks, this six million acre park, three times the size of Yellowstone, that is a, a checkerboard of public land and private land. The areas you see in warm colors there are owned by the private individuals and forest industry. The, the colors you see that are sort of cool and blues are owned by the public and they are forever wild. The problem is that those areas in green forest industry are being divested and they're being divested to developers. And so the question is how much development can we afford before we no longer have what is ostensibly still a wilderness? This is an, an incredibly a uh, resilient ecosystem, except for the wolf and the cougar, nearly every wilderness species that was there when Samuel D. Champlain first saw it uh, 400 years ago is there today, and wolves and cougars have been transiting the Adirondacks in the last 20 years. So the question is, where's that pivot point? That's where the American democracy comes into play. That's where you have a role, because here is where the advocacy groups begin to put their their ideas in motion. Here we have the, regular, the, the folks who, who cherish the regulations and cherish the wilderness and those who cherish the econom economies and the human values of this region. And we have the agencies who are responsible for trying to mediate that. Here's where we're trying to develop a vision for what the wilderness will look like in the future. Will it be a wilderness where we kick everybody out? Will it be a park where we use this to a great extent? Or will it be a place where we sustain lots of human economies? And by the way, we have a wilderness. Where is that point along this continuum? This is a role model for the future. We in, in Michigan have seen the, the impacts of a declining economy and a migration to the southwest. That migration is coming back because they're running out of water and we have it in abundance. They're running out of uh, natural resources and we have it in abundance. They're running out of energy and we have it in abundance. They're coming back. The question is, what are they going to come back to and what are we going to do when they do come back? What will northern Michigan, northern Minnesota, northern Wisconsin, northern New York look like? What will the Great Lakes look like? Will we conserve the wilderness character or will we exploit it? That's the question that you have before you. This is a concrete example and I hope that it's one that you'll think about because it'll be your decision, your generation's decision as to how we manage this. Thank you very much. Thank you um, for this opportunity to, to join this panel. Um, I first became interested in wilderness science as a graduate student in natural resource economics at Colorado State University in the 1990s. <clears throat> and at the time, I admit that I was somewhat of an idealist with regard to national parks and wilderness, having felt frustration at witnessing the spotted owl controversies of that day when protection of owl habitat was pitted against timber jobs in a politically charged showdown of jobs versus owls in the U.S. Pacific Northwest. Environmentalists became outraged at bumper stickers that read, kill a spotted owl, save a logger, or I like spotted owls, fried, that appeared in support of the loggers. And in turn, rural communities near conservation areas were left resentful of environmentalists. I had the opportunity to work with my graduate advisor at that time for, on a project for the Wilderness Society and the Heritage Forest Campaigns where we estimated the economic value of roadless areas in the United States. We found that 
the 42 million acres of roadless areas in the United States, in the 48 conterminous states, provide $600 million in recreation benefits each year and more than $280 million in passive use values, along with nearly 24,000 jobs. We went on to do an estimate of the total economic value of designated wilderness in the lower 48 states and came up with similarly large numbers. These were big numbers, and I naively thought that we had the answers to refute the long-standing conflict between economics and conservation. There was economic value in protecting wilderness, and we had demonstrated it. External validation helped elevate my contentment. Despite the very conventional nature of the methods that we employed, Outside Magazine referred to these studies as maverick economics by pioneer thinkers in wilderness valuation. However, today I have some misgivings about using these economic arguments to justify wilderness policy. It's true that the uh, decision to designate wilderness uh, involves economic trade-offs between wilderness uses and commodity uses, or in many cases, other recreation uses such as motorized or mechanized recreation. In addition, recreation spending by visitors to wilderness areas often has an impact on the economy of communities adjacent to those areas, which can be measured by the effect on jobs or income. And wilderness areas do provide numerous economic benefits to society beyond the value of recreation, including the value of ecosystem services. But it's important to remember that while wilderness lands need not be formally preserved to provide these benefits, some form of land protection is needed to ensure that these benefits are provided in the future. I'd like to draw upon a contemporary example to illustrate the narrow thinking behind economic arguments to justify a wilderness designation. On March 30th in 2009, President Obama signed the Omnibus Public Land Management Act of 2009 into law. And this law designated 52 new wilderness areas and added acreage to 26 existing areas, amounting to a total addition to the National Wilderness Preservation System of over 2 million acres in nine states. In presenting a total package of three wilderness bills on the floor of the U.S. Senate, the first argument presented by Senator Barbara Boxer of California in favor of passing the bills referred to the economic benefits of wilderness. She quoted numerous studies uh, that um, estimated the contribution of recreation spending to the U.S. economy, and she cited literature on the economic benefits of recreation spending, the impact of wilderness on adjacent property values, and the value of ecosystem services, such as watershed protection. In five pages of her comments from the congressional record, Senator Boxer mentioned the economic values of wilderness for this bill 15 times. And there were other numerous references to the income and jobs that are associated with those values. Um, but there was only one mention of the geological values and only one mention of historical features. Upon rereading her comments in preparation for this discussion today, it struck me as peculiar that economic benefits would be given such a prominent role in the management of federal wilderness. Nearly a decade after our wilderness valuation studies, I was pleased to see that economic benefits were given consideration, but the imbalance in the debate seemed to overlook other reasons, ecological or scientific, that seemingly should be emphasized as well. Yet the language of economics has become almost ubiquitous in the conservation movement. The Wilderness Society notes that designated wilderness areas on public lands generate a range of economic benefits for individuals, communities, and the nation among them the attraction and retention of residents and businesses. The Sonoran Institute in Tucson similarly finds that protected natural places are vital economic assets for these local economies in the West that are prospering the most. Other advocates have contended that wilderness designation po positively impacts pro private property values in adjacent areas. To be sure, Senator Boxer's comments about the economic benefits of wilderness were carefully crafted. She was presenting economic arguments in favor of wilderness proposals in response to critics wielding economic positions against designation. Proposals for the designation of wilderness have been celebrated by conservation groups even while they have been largely scorned by local communities, particularly motorized recreation organizations and local chambers of commerce. The basis for the opposition is primarily about access for motorized uses, but the arguments are almost always framed in economic terms. Rural communities claim they can't afford to lose the economic benefits associated with um, uh, motorized and mechanized recreation use by off-road and all-terrain vehicle enthusiasts. 
They claim that local spending by wilderness users is limited to perhaps a meal and some gas, and that jobs with wilderness outfitting businesses are seasonal and only offer pay at or near minimum wages. They contend that the benefits and costs of wilderness designation are not evenly distributed, and that local communities may bear a disproportionate share of the cost in wilderness policy. Wilderness advocates and conservation organists has respond, have responded with economic arguments of their own, and the estimates of economic benefits of wilderness uh, that these groups have offered are impressive. Estimates of economic benefits of ecosystem services often overwhelm local spending by off-road vehicle groups. However, I suggest that countering local opposition on economic grounds is a slippery slope and reduces the real value of wilderness to a commodity that can be bought and sold in markets. I contend that wilderness is far more important than that. Still, John Muir and Aldo Leopold must be turning in their graves to see us bicker over calculation methods used to estimate the benefits and costs of protecting wilderness, as if that was the most important consideration in public land policy. I suggest that the obsession with economic impacts is a relatively recent feature of natural resource management. Since the Second World War, national development policies have been conceptualized or, uh, as an organized and coherent attempt to overcome any barriers to economic growth. And at times, efforts have been explicitly aimed at eliminating perceived environmental constraints on growth. Some have suggested that economic development may be conceived of as a kind of self-conscious or planned construction, mapping and charting both landscapes and mindscapes. An obsession with planning based on science, technology, and a market economy through formal organization is part of the process of rationalization, which builds upon the work of Max Weber and others, who suggested that rationalization is the process by which human reason frames and allows ordering and control of both nature and society. In this view, rationalization and bureaucratization promote efficiency, growth, and materialism. I suggest that a comprehensive view of wilderness policy would be more effective by focusing on the ecosystem services provided by wilderness. Ecosystem services are the conditions and processes through which natural ecosystems sustain and fulfill human life. Example of ecosystem services include clean air and water, essential support in producing re renewable resources such as agriculture and forest products, and the absorption and treatment of waste matter. Wilderness plays an important role in sustaining natural resources and providing ecosystem services that support life on Earth. These areas provide high quality undisturbed soil, water, and air, all of which are crucial to ecosystem health. Ecosystem services do support our economies and thus they, me they um, provide measurable economic values that can be demonstrated in the example of one of the most important ecological services provided by unspoiled areas such as wilderness watershed protection. Road construction, mining, logging, and other industrial activities have been found to contribute to sedimentation. Watersheds <clears throat> protected by wilderness have been found to yield cost savings to water treatment facilities and highway departments from avoiding sedimentation. Drinking water requires sediment removal, mainly by filtration and the introduction of aluminum sulfate and lime. The value of the ecological benefit of watershed protection in wilderness can be conceptualized as the estimated cost savings to water treatment facilities from avoiding sedimentation to begin with. Protection of these services is frequently much less expensive than the cost of pollution control or ecological restoration. Measurement of the flows of ecosystem services, however, is still emergent, as are the economic valuation methods for estimating their benefits. Unfortunately, the values of ecosystem services are just beginning to be accepted at, the, at a time with the, that these services are declining more rapidly than ever. The Millennium Ecosystem Assessment estimates that 60% of ecosystem services are being degraded or used unsustainably. The world's protected areas comprise approximately 12% of surface land in the form of wilderness parks and other reserves. These areas are the single largest source of ecosystem services alongside their more recognized role of providing recreation opportunities. Ecosystems in wilderness provide fresh water, mitigate natural disasters, store carbon, and yes, provide cultural and spiritual values such as recreation. However, debates about wilderness areas rarely focus on these services. 
Rather than focusing on wilderness as preserves that are set aside for the rest of human activity except for tour as tourist destinations, I believe that we need to recognize the broader roles that they play in sustaining our lives, our lifestyles, and our economies. I believe that our view of wilderness areas needs to be transformed. Achieving the multifaceted goals of protecting ecosystem services, mitigating climate change, and conserving biodiversity will require a fundamental shift in our attitudes toward the management and valuation of natural areas such as wilderness, beyond their capacity to just generate jobs from tourist spending. While wilderness need not be justified solely by its economic benefits, consideration of the values provided by ecosystem services in wilderness demonstrates that wilderness protection is a smart investment. Thank you. Thank you to Dr. Porter and Dr. Richardson and all four of our panelists. It's always invigorating to sit here and listen across the themes and topics. And I'm going to throw out some themes that came across to me and then allow the panelists to kind of chat with each other for a bit. But it was interesting to think about how in nature descriptions and writing, it's tied to our personal experiences. But oftentimes, that writing from the American perspective was used to shape how we viewed ourselves because we didn't have the same collective history and collective knowledge and sense of self as our European counterparts. And so what that really did for us. And the idea that there were no more frontiers. And how do we then make sense of our existence with no more frontiers. And the whole spiritual and aesthetic connection was interesting when we go over and think about the conceptions of wilderness and nature and what's the value of wilderness and what does that mean and, and what's the role today. And again, it's that tie back to trying to figure out how do I make sense of myself? How do I make meaning? How do I take my experiences and bring that back to what I do every day? And in Dr. Nelson's talk, I also heard the push towards conservation. So while I'm really thinking about the moral obligations and, and who I am as a person, I realize that I have an obligation to future generations, which means that there's a need to somehow protect or conserve what's there in nature. And, and it's tied to political action. And so absent political action, we're unlikely to really preserve, conserve, or anything of that sort. And then the whole idea of what did it take to move forward with conservation. And it took power in the form of both money and political wielding. And the idea that you have to bring those forces together along with the visionary. Otherwise, the money and the political power drives the process and you wind up with something very far removed from what most people would say is what we ultimately want to achieve. And so there needs to be someone there that's crossing those boundaries. And again, the connection to wilderness re rejuvenating the spirit and the soul. And this sense that we have to conserve because it's important not only to future generations, but to self which is important when you think about the political dynamic because there's always a self-interest involved. And so how do you speak a language to multiple parties that are going to engage them? And then when Dr. Richardson talked about the economic push and pull, and so much in society these days, particularly in the Western sphere, is tied to an economic justification. But what does that reductionism do to us? Does it cause us to lose sight of what we were really trying to achieve when we said nature, wilderness, the frontiers, conservation was important? And what's the balance between economics, ecology, our sense of self, and how do we pull that all together? And so I'm just wondering if having an opportunity to listen to each other, if you had questions for each other or comments. Well, just as a, as, a, as a comment, I had the benefit of uh, hearing my colleagues speak before I did. And as I, as I listened to you all, I found it very interesting to think about some of these early pioneers in, in, in wilderness designation uh, and the arguments they used, uh, like Muir's arguments about um, beauty and spiritual values, and to think about the transition that, that led us from those kinds of um, uh, that kind of framing of wilderness debates to the to the comments that I cited from from Senator Boxer that we've reduced wilderness down to um, how much they generate in tourist spending and, and the associated jobs. It's a it's a very big leap from uh, from the early conversations about wilderness, and I somehow don't know how we got here. <laughs> well, it's interesting that that in the East, those economic arguments 
were the genesis of conservation because it was about ecosystem services. They were preserving the forest not because they were interested in the initially the spiritual value. They saw the forests and the mountains as a sponge that would absorb rainfall and would release it to the canal system. And the canal system was the economic engine between New York City and points west. And so those in New York City saw an economic benefit to preserving the forest. And I suspect that it was really that economic uh, motive that moved the early legislation, at least in the East, rather than the, the spiritual or the, or the health uh, opportunities of, of wilderness, and certainly not the ethical. We, we weren't ready for the, the ethical at that point. Like we are now. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> yeah, I would. So I was thinking of, so you might be thinking, well, what does it matter as long as these areas are saved? Um, and what's the difference between, you know, economic arguments, ecosystem service arguments, these other arguments, and then these other things that we're kind of alluding to? And, and I think it's just important to realize what these arguments are. So if I'm saying that we ought to save areas of wilderness or natural areas because it provides some other good, um, what I'm doing is I'm not, I'm not actually saying wilderness is valuable. I'm saying these other things are valuable and that it's, this is a way to get there. So it's a means to an end argument. In other words, the value that wilderness holds is contingent. And if you can satisfy that value in some other way, you don't need wilderness anymore. And so while for the time being, sort of designating wilderness and thinking about wilderness as economically advantageous might be effective, to think that it's actually a long-term strategy is probably delusional. Um, so what's the alternative? Well, the other alternative is to say, no, it's not, these things aren't valuable because they serve us in some ways. They're, they're just valuable, period. Um, the advantage to that, of course, but the difficulty is getting that to stick. The advantage is once it sticks, it's hard to remove. The value is not contingent. So there's, there is really an important difference. And I would suspect at the end of the day, even on the ground, with that which we preserve, there's an important difference there as well. Also, um, Leopold writes about how, how we redefine community, and that we think not just community it's as people sharing um, a society, but that we have to expand community to understand that that includes water and plants and animals, so that we understand that, that there's these connections that um, are more than just economic. Um, whether we want to recognize that or not, those connections are there. No. Well, thank you again to all the panelists. Can we give the panelists a hand before we open it up to questions? An equally important part of this evening is for you to engage with each other and the panelists. And so we'd like to present an opportunity for you to ask questions, raise points. Yes, and Joyce said you're going to take a yeah. microphone around. We're going to try to get to you with a microphone so that everyone can hear the questions. Take bills, that's a good idea. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, so um, this is for any of the panelists. Um, as I understand it, um, it seems to me that on a more global level, um, many of the most diverse areas um, in the world in terms of like, you know, either phylogenetic diversity or just like raw species richness are also the most like impoverished areas in the world. And that seems to be putting a strain on, on like the, you know, on the, uh, you know, the wilderness there. Um, so how do we deal with that? I think the microphone's broke. <laughs> There's one approach is to think about, about wilderness and conservation in a different way than we traditionally have thought about it. We normally think about, about creating parks in part because of the geological value or the wildlife biodiversity value. And we do that in the context of what's called exclusive conservation. We kick everybody out. And we say, this is a place where nature reigns, but people visit. 
people don't live there. We aren't part of that system. We just visit that system. In contrast, there is inclusive conservation, where we include people within the reserve, and we include human economies within that natural economy. There, the question becomes, how do you manage to accomplish both? That's at the root of this notion of sustainability. And no one has solved that yet. It represents what I think is the challenge of the coming century. But Bill, let me just rewrap it to you in terms of the question that was raised and see if this makes sense. Given what uh, Robbie was talking about in terms of economics, Many of the poor of the world live in, as it's already been explained, uh, unbelievable biodiversity kind of areas, uh, untrammeled un, uh, uh, wilderness by comparison. Yet those same folks would like to be far more uh, you know, involved in an equal world economically. So, I mean, the problem that we have is one of, I think the, the questioner was really raising that, if, if these areas are saved, unfortunately, you know, for the poor of those areas, it, it says you are poor and stay poor and we can save these areas. How, how, do we, how do we balance out the equity issues that you raised around that wilderness was preserved by the rich for the rich? What do we do with the fact that there are many people in the world who are very poor who are in possibly some of the areas that can be most exploited and are currently being exploited for mining, for timber, for various other things that are going on uh, across the globe. There you go, Robbie. Well, um, it's an excellent question that, that uh, doesn't have easy answers. I'll, I'll, I'll share with you one policy tool that economists believe uh, helps to address the issue that's raised in the question. Um, so if we believe that these ecosystem services are valuable, uh, at least in contexts where um, local residents, say, for example, farmers, are engaging in uh, certain practices that may contribute to the degradation of those ecosystems, those of us in the, the uh, in developed countries and in, in wealthy countries, if we value those ecosystem services and we would like for those farmers to, to act in ways that help protect those ecosystem services, we need to give those farmers some incentive to behave differently. And so there's been uh, an explosion in uh, the literature around payments for ecosystem services that tries to, to get at just what you're suggesting by the question. Um, if we want farmers to farm in ways that help pr uh, protect against soil erosion or protect water quality, uh, should we pay them uh, some either in cash or some non-cash payments uh, to, to encourage better practices? Or for example, in Africa, uh, I've worked in, in wilderness in, in uh, Zambia, where uh, because of this kind of divide that Dr. Porter mentioned earlier, where we take humans live here and the rest can be nature, um, people who have traditionally lived near wilderness areas in Zambia have used wildlife for hunting and um, also uh, tourist hunters come over and spend lots of money to, to kill an elephant or whatever. That's led to uh, sharp declines in population. Today there are programs set up to compensate um, rural villages for the provision of these ecosystem services such as protection of wildlife habitat. So that's one way I think that we can address this sort of wilderness poverty divide. Um, again, it goes back to some of the rationalization and reductionism that I talked about um, in terms of quantifying economic values. But um, sort of as looking at drivers of human behavior, if we want these ecosystem services to be protected, we have to give people incentives to act in ways that, uh, that are consistent with that. As a casual observer, I have to say that I've followed some of the work of Dr. Eleanor Ostrom, who is an economist and moved over into sustainability issues. And it's interesting because it's definitely a move in terms of trying to deal with the common pool resource problem. 
and there's pushback. So this whole sense of how do you help communities maintain a sense of balance and move forward and be able to have a say in what happens, the very people who could come to the table and construct solutions with communities challenge whether or not that's an appropriate method. And so it's an age-old problem. I and mean, we heard from the very first story where you're clearing the land, you're moving the people, and you're moving the animals. And we haven't quite found the solution yet. I was going to say whoever has the answer up here is probably the next um, Nobel laureate, um, because we haven't really solved it yet. <laughs> the other thing I noticed about y your example is that it, it challenges us. So sometimes what we do is we think of naturalness and wilderness and biodiversity as one thing. And your example was an articulation of a place where humans live that is biodiverse. Um, and so. So in some ways, we think, well, we don't, I mean, my first reaction is that I don't think we have a problem in those places. Um, in fact, we have lots of little hot spots where it's actually where humans live. It's not where humans don't live um, that are areas of biodiversity. It also raises the question about what is the target of conservation? Is it preserving areas that don't have humans? Is it preserving areas that are biodiverse? Is it preserving areas that have ecosystem services? If we think those are all the same thing, we're probably wrong about that. Um, and if they're not all the same thing, there's a better debate to have about the, I mean, it raises the question of what the future of conservation is. The, 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 the challenge of sort of confronting this, you know, what about impoverished people who, who you know, want to live in a, in a different world problem over and over again? And I, I mean, I, you know, I, I hear this a lot. Um, my reaction always to that is if we really live in a world, if we really live in a world where we've allowed that to be the choice we have to make, I think we're done. I, I don't think there's a solution to that. Um, if it really is the case that either we have to choose for human affluence um, or nature, and if it's also the case that humans and nature are entwined in really profound ways, I think it's over uh, at that point. I'm not sure that's actually the story. Um, and I think I know some people who would like me to believe that's the story, uh, who would sort of reap great benefits from me believing that story. I'm not sure I believe it, um, but, but I can imagine things. I'm good at imagining. Okay, well, we had a question over here. A uh, question for Professor Nelson. Is th I wonder if there's any way to find a middle position between valuing, I don't know if we should say nature, wilderness, whatever, for itself or for its instrumental value for us. Uh, if we could identify, as you sort of suggested, uh, a way in which it is uniquely beneficial to us, that nothing else could supply us with the sort of spiritual or moral grounding that you're talking about. Yeah, so it's, I mean, I think this is some of the articulations of existence value, that it's not just another instrumental value or an economic value, it's, it's not replaceable, it's not, it, it, it's not contingent, because you can't replace it with something else. The other thing to, I think, remember is that when we talk about maybe the difference between instrumental value and intrinsic value, that they're not, they're not at odds with one another necessarily. That if I, I mean, if I value my children, I don't have any children, but imagine I did, and I value my children, you know, uh, intrinsically, I'm still going to take the tax write off, right? I mean, you can value things both ways at the same time. If you value things intrinsically, it doesn't mean you don't value them instrumentally. If you all internalize that, you'll be smarter than about 99% of the people who deal with these questions of value, because that one really gets us over and over again. So there are ways to, to have a middle ground and combine these things. There are smarter ways to think about value, absolutely. There's a question all the way in the back. I'll start here and then over there. Yeah, hi. Um, I was wondering about these sort of economic models that look at the total value provided by wilderness areas. Um, it seems to me, as a rhetorical device to convince people to try to preserve the wilderness, it, it seems problematical. So like if 100 or 150 years ago, there had been economic models that said that the uh, value of wilderness in the Congo was far exceeded by the value to the people of the Congo uh, for selling their or having their minerals taken from them, Hoke Shield that you were talking about wouldn't have been convinced by that because he doesn't personally benefit from this. E even if it's a total higher number, the value, the number is higher. His personal value is much higher for this lower way because he benefits and he owns the property rights to this land. He owns the mineral rights. So likewise, to say that um, 
you know, the total value of water purification from this wilderness area uh, is much, it far exceeds, you know, having to buy bottled water and all these other things. Rich people can benefit enough from exploiting and cutting down all these trees that they can afford to buy bottled water. And the people who live in the area are the ones that are left with the problem. And so if, I, I'm just wondering to what extent it's, you think that saying that the total number is bigger is a valuable technique when the people who are in a position to make a decision, their personal number um, you know, is, a, is very, very different than what the public's benefit would be. It's a, it's a really good question. Um, certainly, Senator Boxer, when she was speaking on the floor of the Senate, was talking about some of these, uh, you know, the total value. Um, but the, the conflict that I cited in my remarks is really, uh, and it's consistent with what you're saying, this is a distributional question. We can say that the total value generated by um, both use uh, and non-use of particular areas might be some large number. But in a way, um, those of us who, who value places um, for their existence um, may live very far away from, from the, the, the places themselves. And so the local people, local communities adjacent to wilderness areas may in fact bear some, um, some cost that's not, uh, not shared as equally as the, uh, the benefits in terms of um, by designating wilderness, certain land uses are then uh, off limits. And so to the degree that those other uses that might have been um, put into play in, in, in these areas might have generated local economic value, the designation of wilderness sort of precludes that at the local level. But then those of us who um, may never see a polar bear or a, a tiger in our lives may in fact uh, respond with positive values for the existence uh, of those species or for the protection of their habitats because we simply enjoy living in a world where those kinds of species run wild. Um, for people living adjacent to those areas, they may not see those values in quite the same way. So the big numbers generated by these economic valuations um, really don't depict um, the true nature of the trade-offs that exist at the local level. And I think there, there are issues to grapple with there. I don't know if that completely addresses your, uh, if your question, others. The, the concrete way to think about that would, in the Adirondacks uh, is that it was a historical coincidence. The, the folks who were there to preserve the forest because it would provide an ecological service of absorbing moisture and releasing it slowly into the canal system over the, the course of a year were stronger than the folks who wanted to exploit the forest resources. And they were stronger because the, forest, the folks who wanted to exploit the resources had liquidated those resources and they'd moved to Michigan. And so politically they weren't really ready to do battle for something that was going to be a resource for them 50 years from now. The folks who, who had an immediate need and saw a long-term benefit were able to put that immediate need and that long-term benefit together and they were stronger. And so one of the lessons could be from this, it depends on who's politically stronger and who has the greater financial motivation at the moment. I want to ask Dr. Carmichael a question in terms of thinking about what's the future of nature writing or wilderness writing or environment, you know, the transitions over time. And is it important that that remain a part of our culture and how do we get there? Um, I think it is important. Will nature writing have some form other than environmental writing that has a much more political or kind of, of presence. I'm not sure. Um, when I taught a class of honor students and we looked at um, writings about nature and looked at environmental writing as well, for their, their final work I asked them to um, write about this shift and would there come a time when the word nature would be replaced by environment and, and environmental and almost all of them said yes that nature would be a word that sort of slides from our language. Um, and some of my students told me it already had, which made me very nervous. Um, 
you know, and so what, what do we do to convince people that we can have both in our vocabulary? And, and how do we convince people that there's, there's, uh, that, that we can have both kinds of, of lenses to look at it? Because when we say environmental, suddenly it's very much, um, man is in there muddling around and fixing the environment, right? As opposed to when we talk about being in nature, where it's, it's we're, we're not manipulating or, or, or changing things as much. And I'm not sure how to convince particularly my students, that there's still this importance. I've actually had students that didn't realize we had ducks on the river. They've, they've always marched right past. Um, and that's really disturbing. And I guess part of it is, you know, what I try to do in the classroom, too, is, you know, introduce them to, to reading things that, that aren't necessarily um, environmental, that look at some of the older literature where we could talk about nature in, in different kinds of ways. Thank you. There was another question in the back on the right side. I want to thank the panel for, for moving presentations and provide a little bit of comment and that one of the things that I think um, was talked about was the economic value, but it was brought up how the economic value is only one value that can be ascribed to nature. And it's a, a very pressing one, especially in these economic times. And my question today is, is like a, a citizens of Lansing who is looking at the city parks, which is, although not wilderness, could be considered green space. And it's being put up for sale to, for, um, for developers to build. And thinking about how the challenge of actually having to preserve or conserve wilderness as opposed to like developing it, you, Dr. Porter, you suggested there's, there's a, a different way that's kind of some sort of balance of those and use the Adirondack Mountains as an example of uh, one area where they are trying to do that. But I'm wondering if there's something more smaller scale that you could give as an example or a model of what that may look like. Well, we heard very early on the example of Central Park in New York City as that case example of trying to preserve an element of nature in a sea of humanity and I think that really is the fundamental question going forward in the next for the next several generations um, in American conservation ethic how do we sustain the natural qualities that are integral to our being that are part of our ethic that are that are part of our soul and at the same time, promote a vibrant economy, which is our motive for being. Um, I agree with, with Michael. If it's a zero-sum game, we're done. Um, that's just not acceptable. That's not going to be, and I don't, I don't believe that that's going to be the future. I think we are going to find a different way, but I don't know that anybody has a sense of what that, that way is. Um, as our dean mentioned, you know that might be worthy of a Nobel Prize if someone <laughs> could figure that out. So, Michael, work on that one. Yeah. In my spare time. Yeah. Let me ask one question. I mean, you know, we, when I look at students across this campus, and you know, they probably have had more access to the environment through the animal planet than they have through actually going out and being there. And I'm concerned personally with the idea that we are now filming polar bears to the point that polar bears may disappear, but they will forever be kind of reruns on Animal Planet. So to what degree, you know, when I think about travel literature, long ago, people would read about exotic places. Now they don't have to read about them. They can see the films, roll it again. So to what degree are we really transforming our understanding of nature, of conservation, of environment, of all of these different things by virtue of the fact that all of that stuff very well may disappear and we could live with it still forever because of the fact that we don't have to go there and see it. That is, it, it can disappear and then you know, we have caught it in effect. Something we couldn't do with the passenger pigeons you know, we can, you can stuff a bird, and we've got enough at the museum, 
But I mean, if you stuff a bird, that's one thing, but this way you can continue to hear their songs. Could you comment on that as a panel? These are, you, you, you highlight an interesting point. I mean, these are, you're describing the sort of vicarious experiences with nature that really uh, are not, uh, they're very different from the childhood experiences that we may recall uh, and, and so forth. Um, uh, and, and it's interesting to think about the implications of those vicarious experiences continuing on well beyond uh, the, the actual existence of the species that we're watching. It's a tremendous asset that we have. I mean, I, I, I become uh, completely engrossed in, in, in nature films when I'm watching them. Um, but I don't think that it can take the place of, of real interactions, human interactions, um, that combine not only the sights and sounds that we can see on the screen, but, uh, but also the smells and um, the sense of touch that we, uh, when, that we experience when we truly interact with nature, as the subtitle of this panel uh, forum refers to. Um, yeah, I don't know if others have comments. So I was, my, my colleague Allison Hawthorne Deming um, thinks about writers as um, tier leaders. That's her expression, and, and their job is to, is to uh, show us grief and that we react to grief. Uh, and so the, one of the ways I was thinking of your question is, do, do really good nature documentaries of a certain kind uh, allow us to push the grief off uh, in a way, right? We don't experience it, or we don't have to because we got them on film. Uh, who needs them in the Arctic? I, I don't know. I, I could imagine that there are, there are nature videos that, that could do that, that could sort of lead us to that illusion. Um, but at the same time, film is a great way to bring us to that grief, if, if grief is what one of the things that might actually move us. So I think of film as just such an unbelievable tool, uh, especially if you could combine good philosophical analysis with film. Uh, that would be an, an incredible tool. But I guess, to be honest, I didn't have that worry until you raised it, but now I'm shaking a little bit, so, <laughs> so thanks. I think part of the problem, too, is that when we see these films, they've been edited. And, and so the experience we're seeing has been shaped by someone. Um, so it's, it's not the same experience, but if we have nothing else to judge by or compare to, then that becomes an unedited, edited reality. And those are some of the, the, the dangers that frighten me. The other way to think about it is to turn that question on its head. And that is, why are they so popular if we don't really value nature? The fact that, that there are so many of them, that they are watched with such loyalty, suggests that we as a society do value those kinds of ideals in a, in a very deep and fundamental way. Um, we as a society have less opportunity than earlier generations to interact with them because we are an urban society. Um, but you might argue that we are an urban society that still feels its roots and that's the way that, that we scratch the itch that is part of those roots. It seems to me that if uh, wilderness is meaningful, it's not necessarily meaningful to society, which is an abstract term, but to individuals. So I wonder if uh, the panel might take off your academic robes and mention how you relate to wilderness or to nature. For me, um, I guess I would describe it as th those times when you shift consciousness almost and um, listen to birds. Right? Um, it, it, it takes you away from the, the, the hard and solid and concrete and can take you places that, that 
you, you can't necessarily um, describe as having, uh, what's the word I want, um, something that's necessarily solid and firm, that it takes you places that, that transport you from the, the, the solid, the rooted, the, the feet on the ground to, to another place. My experiences, uh, I guess, more and more these days are through environmental science. And so I work a lot with wildlife ecologists in the field. Um, I work on the Isle Royal Wolf Moose Project. So I'm on Isle Royal part of the summer, sometimes in the winter. Um, that's mostly how I have my experience through, <laughs> through big things killing other big things, uh, which is an interesting kind of experience, I, I admit. Um, and at home, it's, you know, personally, I'm sort of taking care of things, so taking care of our land, taking care of um, ourselves through our, our garden. So, I mean, in some ways, I think of all the work that I do as a kind of caretaking, and, and my experiences with, with nature come through, come through that. It's a, it's a very interesting question because it, it's causing a bit of an epiphany right, right in the moment for me. I was listening on the way here to an NPR segment on extrovert versus introvert and how society has shifted in its views of what those qualities mean and the definition that the that this person was articulating was along the lines of, of not the degree of, of interest in social interaction but the, the degree of energy that one gets from being with a group or not with a group. And from my earliest memories, I can tell you that it wasn't people that gave me energy. So I suspect that makes me an introvert. Um, it was nature. It was being out in the, in the woods and in the fields. And as an academic, I had the opportunity in an earlier life to play an administrative role. And in those times of greatest stress and tension, uh, what you found me doing was going out hunting uh, because that was the release. That was the, the way to cope. Uh, so, you, you ask a very interesting question I'm going to have to think about. I'm a bit stumped as well, but I, um, I, I suppose that the, the way I, have, I see myself as interacting with nature on a personal level is through national parks. My friends tease me about being the, the number one fan of national parks, and it's something that makes me oddly kind of patriotic um, because the concept of national park, you know, the Yellowstone was the first national park in the world. Um, and when I was a, a student, I had this ambition of going and, and visiting every national park in the United States. And, you know, they give these passports that you can go into each national park visitor uh, center and get a stamp. Um, but these were the places that I went to sort of leave, um, as Dr. Porter mentions, you know, sort of leave the, the chaos of everyday life. Um, and I, I liked visiting them alone as opposed to with other people um, because of the quiet that that affords. And in a class that I teach, I, I challenge students to do something that I like to do when I visit such places. And that is to sit still and look at one thing for some period of time. I think in the, in the assignment I use in class, it's you know, 20 minutes, which is in our, in our short attention span today, that's a pretty long time. But to watch um, an ant on the ground for a very long period of time, or even, uh, I was thinking about Dwight's question about city parks, you know, to even watch um, a non-living thing like a rock, and it's, you start to notice the colors and shadows of lichen uh, that grow on the rock um, in ways that you wouldn't see it if you were just walking past it. And I think that, um, you know, in answer to your question, I think that, that, that the most meaningful aspect of interacting with nature for me is to sit still um, and, and watch and know that, that for that period of time I won't hear the ding on my laptop that reminds me that a new email has arrived or that the phone is ringing. 
Um, it, it's just a very, I guess it's, in, and in a way it's very, very spiritual, but it's a gift that, that I give to myself because I find it so difficult to, to have that kind of meaningful experience on a day-to-day -day basis. So if I might take liberty, um, for me it really is about that alone time in the sense that there is something larger than me and, and life itself. And so, you know, being in a place where there are geese and all kinds of wild birds and deer and, and just watching what they do and, and what they don't do and being able to be in the midst of that experience, sitting on the edge of a shore and looking at the vastness of the ocean, having that time where everything just stands still and it's, it's just me and the universe. And one of the things that was, I moved here from Los Angeles. So aside from big culture shock, one of the things that was really hard was I used to go to another city park, Griffith Park, a massive park in the heart of Los Angeles and it had mountains that you could hike and every weekend I hiked with my dog. And then we came here and that was no longer a part of our experience and it was like, wait, my, my connection, my groundedness was gone. So to me, nature, and I think of it broadly, is really realizing that, that we're just part of the universe and if we allow ourselves to go in that, we're, we're able to connect to others because we realize that there's something more than just me. Did we have another question? All right, we'll take this question and then I want to make sure we provide time for you to one-on-one -on -one be able to talk with the panel. So as the panel presented their perspectives and kind of painted the big picture for us, you know, we can see that it's really a global picture and that it's, you know, temporal or historical. It's been there and happening a long time. But it's interesting how the questions are kind of bringing it more back to, you know, what can we do on a small scale or simple or, you know, what can the individual do? And I think that's looking and becoming aware of just how big these issues are for me. That's, you know, and you go to look, okay, so what do I do? <clears throat> Excuse me. The teachings there are pretty consistent, more, you know, change is going to come one person at a time. So, and that's, I think it was great listening to know how you've addressed that. Um, I would say, you know, looking here on campus, what can we do? that a big part of what the Student Organic Farm was about, is about, is creating a place where the students who are stuck in these dorm rooms and are getting, hearing lectures all the time can actually come and experience something. And that's what we're hearing all the time from them about how sacred the farm, a, pla a sacred place the farm has become because it's somewhere where they can come and actually experience. And I think we can do more of that experience thing here at MSU. I wish we could do more. You know, I'd like to know when we're going to offer a class on um, how to become native to a place because clearly there are curricula out there. There are people who talk about that and how critical that is in a country where we're moving around all the time and if you're not, don't have that sense of sacredness, that native, being native to some place that it's hard to do all these other bigger things that we need to do to answer these questions in the value environment. So I think, you know, we should be, are any of you interested in teaching that course or how do we go about getting a course in, you know, becoming native to place where we can really help students do, you know, not read about all of the reading and everything is experienced, but you can't really write about well, you can. It's, it's hard to write unless you've actually experienced something. Maybe the best writing comes from the experiences, the way to frame it. But, you know, how are we going to do that? You know, and when, you know, we, maybe we just pick some bigger issues. Sorry, this is going to go a little bit afield, but I feel like it's a part of this. We, you know, we're trying to wrestle with all this stuff, but here on campus, the thing that bugs me the most is over and over again, I hear people saying, how are we going to deal with 9 billion people in 2050, right? Are you hearing, anybody else hearing that? And it's like, I don't understand why people are asking that question. I think we should be asking, do we want 9 billion people in 2050? Is that going to be a good thing? And it's not something that we can decide for the rest of the world, but we can clearly be doing something like, should we be making more and more food 
to try to feed those nine billion people, which is what many of my colleagues are trying to do. And it's like, it just, they seem so disconnected from what the questions really should be, that how do you do that? And again, I think it's getting people native to place, getting people connected, getting people out of their heads and into their hearts. And you can only do that really by doing something. That's what, to me, I say subversively. I don't tell anybody that, but what the farm is about, if I can get them out there and get their hands in the dirt a little bit, I, I got them. You know, they're, you know, that thing that's in us can come out, but we got to do something and help people see to do something, just even if it's just one person at a time. I will teach that class. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, I would definitely teach that class because I think that's exactly right. I mean, the more transient we are, the and we're in big trouble uh, if we're transient. Um, so one of the things that you, lots of your comments had in common, you gave us a bunch of good examples, actually. I don't know if you realize that. Um, but a lot of things you said are things that, that we can do and we can do more of. And a lot of the comments are a, this kind of sense of, uh, of disempowerment. And so we have all these little ways to give away our power. We like to think people take it from us, but we often give it away, too. Um, and we, we frame questions in a certain way to give away our power. And I think once we kind of realize that, then we start thinking, can I frame them differently? Um, so this question, what should I do with my life, if, if, in case you're wondering when professors miss office hours, it's because they're afraid students are going to come and ask that question. Uh, that's why you don't show up for office hours. It's the most horrifying question. Well, that's right? why you don't show up. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Well, you have other reasons. I sit in my office and wait if I thought Well, it's a big deal. I mean, it's a big deal. So one of the things that uh, I've been less afraid to stay in my office lately, uh, and one of the things that when students ask me that question, I always quote to them, uh, there's a theologian um, named Frederick Beekner, uh, and he speaks really quite directly to this. And, and he says, you, you have one job in life, and that is you need to figure out what your great joy is and you need to figure out what the world's great need is. And that your work is at the intersection of your great joy and the world's great need. You go to that place and you do that work. That's, that's one job. That's, that's what we have to do. So helping students and helping one another um, find that, that intersection of, of joy and need um, is, is also a, a great job. Um, and I think I'll do it in my class that I volunteer to teach. That's not an overload volunteer, by the way. <laughs> Just be clear. <laughs> um, a couple different people actually alluded to some solutions, and, and I don't know if you really caught them. Um, one of it was in the Central Park example, um, and one was also kind of in the farm. But a couple years ago, I had a colleague who was on the Lansing Township Planning Commission. And one of the things to do is think about, you know, are communities even engaging in master plans? Are they even thinking about how they're using vacant land? and of that nature. And if they aren't, who's going to be the person that kind of brings that idea to fruition? So is it going to those meetings enough that you're a pest that someone says we have to do something to get them away? Or are you that person that sits on that commission that can influence and shape that master plan? I mean, that's something very concrete that can happen almost immediately in terms of being a voice. A lot of times those planning commissions are sitting around waiting for things to come to them, waiting for someone to ask for a variance. That's not very exciting. So, you know, let's give them some real work to do in terms of how are we dealing with our blighted areas. I mean, I think not just about Lansing, but Detroit and all of the, the land that can be reclaimed. And so that's just one concrete step that we could take towards reclaiming nature in our urban areas. Are there other questions? Well, I want to thank our panelists, and I want to thank you as well for your insightful comments and questions. We'll be here for another couple of minutes, so we do encourage you, if you have individual questions, to come and see them. And I also want to make sure that you hold the date. I'm sure you've gotten the flyer, but by being here tonight, we give you a charge to go out and tell at least five other people about the sharper focus wider lens. For the faculty, it's easy. You just do it in your class, and you've already hit five. Um, and students, you can do the same thing. Stand up in a class and tell people. Um, April 10th, we usually do Mondays. The next one will be on a Tuesday. Is there an American character? Um, and again, going to come at it from lots of different perspectives. We ask you to keep your eyes out for additional announcements, and we hope to see you again. Thank you. <laughs>